I'm very happy first to be there uh, for this uh, text, uh, let's say, final presentation. And uh, I'm really happy that this project uh, comes to not an end, but uh, let's say a milestone. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm going to not talk about uh, the study because you will a lot. So I'm going to first try to widen a bit uh, the topic. And uh, uh, you had a nice introduction to, to geodesy because you said for, with GNSS you can map the gravitational field. But not only with GNSS, I mean the, the, the tool with what you can map the gravitational field is uh, our clocks. So I'm going to first uh, give you an overview of the pr rec very recent progress in time and frequency metrology. Then I will introduce a bit to relativistic time and frequency transfer uh, to tell you what are the problems, the challenges. Uh, I will introduce briefly what uh, I, we call cr chronometric geodesy, meaning also clock-based geodesy. And I will talk about some uh, ongoing projects uh, our, our lab is involved uh, into. And some ideas, I will finish with some ideas for the future. Because I was in the ICT, so <laughs> <laughs> we need to think about future. Very quickly, what's a clock? It's uh, how to measure a frequency. So you interrogate some atoms and uh, you, you, you measure basically a frequency, but any measurement in, in physics uh, is not perfect. So it's not the true frequency that you measure. You have some uh, <coughs> frequency offset, the bias, and uh, some, fre some frequency fluctuations. So how do you characterize a clock? First, with uh, the accuracy, meaning how far you have from the true frequency, and this you can only evaluate. Okay, and stability. And this is how, let's say, you can average the fluctuation with time. And this we use uh, what we call the Allen deviation, which is how this fluctuation average with time. So these are the two graphs showing the, the recent progress. Uh, well, there you can see the progress with, with the years in accuracy of the clocks. So now we have uh, in our lab, for example, we have microwave clocks. They are 10 to the minus 16 accuracy. It's called also uh, uh, Fontaine's clock, cesium Fontaine's, because it's based on cesium atom. And the cesium atom is the one we use to define the second, the unit second. So we use these clocks. But now we have much more accurate clocks, uh, which are optical clocks uh, that work not in the microwave domain, but in the optical domain. And um, this was uh, due to, uh, to, the, to the progress in, um, in frequency comb. And um, <coughs> now the best performance of optical clocks is 6.410 to the minus 18. So far better than the cesium clock. Uh, this is for accuracy, and it's constantly uh, decreasing. Uh, it goes very fast. You can see here in black the cesium clocks and in red the progress of the optical clocks. So you see that the progress is uh, much faster in accuracy and we are now here and there is no theoretical limit. So, well, there are some but uh, not, not with this clock. So we can, uh, we can do some progress. Uh, for the stability, it's even better. You can see that you can average up to uh, the, the best one is uh, an Ethereum clock, and you can average down in seven hours only <coughs> down to 1.610 to the minus 18, which is incredible. So the research in accurate clock is very active. Uh, it's innovative, competitive. There are many teams around the world that try to go better and better in accuracy and stability. So it's good to have a, a good clock, but uh, you have to have a mean to compare them. And there, uh, let's say it's, uh, it's, a bit, uh, it's a bit tough because we don't have uh, the mean to compare them uh, as good as the clock are. 
So what are the, 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 the long distance, long distance uh, techniques, the best ones up to now? So you have uh, satellite radio techniques with GNSS, two-way satellite time and frequency transfer. And they reach about 10 to the minus 15 frequency stability after one day of averaging. So 10 to the minus 15 to compare with 10 to the minus 18, we are not here yet. You would need to, being very optimistic and being very optimistic and saying that you can average uh, down for three years, then you would attain 10 to the minus 18. But of course, it's being too optimistic. Okay. Okay. Now you have a new uh, technique, which is T2L2, which is an optical uh, link that you can uh, go uh, to 10 to the minus 13, few 10 to the minus 13 after 10 second averaging. And you would need, being optimistic, 25 days to uh, attain uh, 10 to the minus 18. But you have to remember that the optical clock can um, run only for less than a day and it attains 10 to the minus 18 in only 7 hours. So you need a link that is able to do that also. And it doesn't exist yet. Well, at least not on long distance. And soon you will have an ISIS microwave link which is expected to reach 2 to the minus 15 after 300, 300 second averaging. So you would need 5 days to reach 10 to the minus 18 also being very optimistic, meaning supposing that it would average, but of course it would not. Now, uh, you have a new technique which is very promising, which is a fiber, uh, fiber optical link. Uh, so it's a phase coher coherent fiber link. It has been demonstrated on 100 to 2000 kilometers, and it can be um, uh, deployed on continental scales. So you cannot do intercontinental comparison. It would be too costly, too complicated. Uh, but you can do on continental scale. Um, there is an intensive uh, development going on. For example, th there I just plotted uh, uh, put a graph of a French project, which is called Refimev, which uh, aims to connect all these towns also with the, with the UK and uh, Germany and Italy. Uh, all these labs together with fiber links. And with fiber links, uh, you can go to uh, 10 to the minus, well, 410 to the minus 19 in just 100 seconds. So this is, uh, yes, it's, it's okay to, to compare optical clocks. Uh, there are also some projects, but it's uh, very at the very beginning to do some op coherent optical links in space, well, uh, in uh, free air, not in fibers. But this is not still, uh, it's still uh, at the beginning and it's not working yet. Well, not at least uh, at these at this levels of uh, accuracy. Uh, we can think also about transportable optical clocks. Uh, to be able to, to compare, you just bring it to the other lab. Okay, now what is, uh, this is a very brief introduction to relativity. Uh, you have to do a, a difference between the proper time of a clock, which is uh, an observable that you can observe, you just count the number of ticks of the clock, and the coordinate time, which is uh, mathematical time, paper time, and it's just a convention. It's kind of a grid that you can build uh, to to on, on space time. And the relation, well, this is just a sketch. Suppose you have a clock, so its proper time is zero here at uh, coordinate time zero. Then it goes around a trajectory in space and time. And when the coordinate time is five, then the proper time is maybe not five, but four, and it depends on which trajectory the clock uh, followed. And the relation between both is dito over dt, so the deriva derivative of proper time over uh, the coordinate time is this formula that maybe, well, some of you know, and uh, it involves 
um, the trajectory because you have to integrate along the trajectory, the velocity of the clock, and the space-time metric, which depends on the distribution of the mass, uh, well, on the gravitational field. And this is a local, uh, really local relation. So, for example, you have two clocks that are synchronized at some coordinate time equal to zero, and you look five seconds after in coordinate time, and as they took different trajectory, they are no more synchronized. So you have to synchronize them uh, with some way. There are some ways of synchronizing it. This is just a nice historical example that I like to show, uh, which is the first uh, NAVSTAR GPS satellite, uh, where they really observed the difference of the flow of time between a clock on ground and a clock in the GPS uh, satellite. So this is, you see that there is a, a difference between both. There is a slope, which is just the redshift that you talked about, uh, plus a, a second Doppler effect. And at the beginning, the engineer, uh, they were not sure, well, some of, the, some of them perhaps, but most of them said, okay, we have to be cautious, so we don't put any frequency offset, but we put a button that if the effect is there, we can switch on. So this, this is where the switch on the button, you see, because the flow of time was going faster on board the satellite compared to a, to a, a clock on ground. So they just shifted uh, artificially the frequency of the, of, the, of the clock on board the satellite and to have, a, well, to synchronize it to the ground clock. So now it's a well-known effect and it's taken into account in uh, all GNSS. So this is not a, a, a small effect huh, in, uh, in GNSS. You, you would have a, a, around 10 kilometer error after one day of integration in positioning. So it's a big effect. And also I want to talk about uh, TAI, which is the Atomic International Time. Uh, you, all, all your times, UTC, uh, on, are, are based on, on this realization of a coordinate time. Uh, so it's a fake time, it's a coordinate time, which is based, in fact, on averaging around 400 clocks around the world and also realizing the unit second with some very uh, accurate cesium fountain clocks. And this is the definition. TAI is a coordinate time scale defined in the geocentric reference frame with the SE second as realized on the rotating geoid. Why I put this? Because it's a good transition with geodesy. Because you see that time depends on gravitational field and when you want to define a time, a coordinate time, here you have to, you refer to the geoid. And the geoid is well, depends on, on, the f on the form of the Earth. So you see that there is a link uh, between the shape of the Earth, the mass of the Earth, the gravitational field, and the time. And now I want to introduce to chronometric geodesy so that you can see how now you can use clock as tools to probe the gravitational field. So what is the very basic principle? We said that the, the flow of time is different depending on the gravitational field and its velocity. So uh, you have a frequency shift of the clock depending on the gravitational field. So the basic relation is this, delta f over f. Delta f is the frequency shift between two clocks. And this depends on which uh, gravitational potential they, they are at their location. So these are isopotential. On this line, you have this po potential, B, uh, WB. On this line, you have this potential, WA. And when you compare two clocks, which are supposed to give the same time if they are compared locally, here they, have it, they are in different gravity fields, so they give a different frequency. And the difference in frequency is just the difference in the gravity potential, omega, uh, WB and WA, divided by C squared. 
and there are some corrections. Well, we'll see what are these corrections. And the gravity field, W, is uh, the gravitational field U of the Earth plus a, comp a velocity component. So now, if you want, you, you can do now, uh, um, uh, you can do this, this translation between uh, a frequency, a relative frequency shift of your clock. And if you look at uh, the level of, of the, uh, the stability of the clocks today, 10 to the minus 18, then it corresponds to a difference in height in the gravitational field on ground of the Earth of one centimeter. And this has been uh, very nicely uh, uh, shown by uh, uh, Shu, the Shu et al. Um, paper in Science in 2010, where they compared two optical clocks in their lab. And they asked the, the, this is so the difference in frequency between both. They were at the same height. And at some point in time, they just uh, lift one of the clock of in uh, 30 centimeters of 30 centimeters only 30 centimeters and they were able to see the difference in the frequency shift of the two clocks so you see the result is 37 plus or minus 15 centimeters so 15 centimeters <coughs> mean that they had uh, an accuracy in, the, in their clock of about 5 10 to the minus 17 and now you can go up to 10 to the minus 18 in stability. So see variations which are in the range of one centimeter with clocks. <coughs> so this is really good if you have a mean to compare them at this level. Okay, so now you can give a lot of definitions uh, with this relativistic view of space-time, you can define isochronometric surfaces where all the clocks beats at the same flow at the, with the same flow uh, and there are almost these isochronometric surfaces they are almost equivalent to equipotential surfaces of the gravity because you see uh, where? yes you see here this uh, C minus 4 terms which are the difference between the isochronometric surfaces and the Newtonian potential, they are of order 2 millimeters. So you have correction around 2 millimeters. So 2 millimeters is again far away the, the, the accuracy we can get today. So uh, maybe we can dream in the future of this accuracy. But for now, we can really say that the isochronometric surfaces are equivalent to the Newtonian isopotentials. Uh, the geopotential is known with an accuracy uh, bit, well, let's say around 10 centimeters on, on ground, on the surface, on a grid of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers. And these models are done with, um, with uh, satellite techniques like GRACE or GOCHE, plus uh, ground gravimetric data. So we do some nice uh, models like this of the geoid, which represent the geopotential of the Earth. Uh, now you can uh, you have to define a surface of reference where you say okay the atomic time will be the time of clocks on this surface of reference the geoid and historically it has been defined on the mean uh, surface of the of the sea which follows an isopotential um, okay so. Let's say now we, we have to shift and say, OK, uh, clocks can give time. Uh, but this time now it begins to be a bit perturbed by the gravitational field because we have the accuracy to, to enough accuracy to, to be dependent on this gravitational field. So can we use clocks to measure the potential of the Earth? So I, I did a small, uh, a small experiment. Uh, well, a small experiment. I just took the result of uh, the comparison of two clocks, which are one, uh, of these are Fontaine clocks, so it's 10 to the minus 16 uh, uh, accuracy. Uh, one was in uh, in Rim, in uh, Torino, and one in Sirte, in Paris. 
They were compared by standard techniques, GNSS to way. You see there, here are the two clocks. And uh, of course, the difference in frequency depends on uh, the Newtonian potential they are on. And this Newtonian potential, you know, depends on the shape of the Earth. And the shape of the Earth, in the first approximation, you can say that it's uh, like this, with the G2. So it's uh, flattened. And uh, then, OK, you say, if I know all the parameters, like the GM of the Earth, blah, 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 blah so the, the zeroth order uh, uh, multiple, then maybe I, I can get the G2. So I just uh, took the result of this comparison, and I found a G2 of uh, this value, which is around 1.4% of the best value. So it's not very accurate because, of course, the clocks on ground that depends on all the higher order multiples. So, but it's just a proof of experiment and it was very simple because I just took the result of a paper, of a comparison, and just inverse this equation and have the G2 already at uh, one, um, uh, around 1%. One so it's really a, a proof rough proof of principle that you can get with a simple comparison uh, that the, the Earth is, is flattened. But, okay, you can go, uh, now you can go a bit further and say, okay, can I test the, the best, uh, the best uh, geopotential models with the clocks? So here what I plot is uh, two models to the two, one of the two best models of geopotential, which are EGM 2008 and Agen 6C2. And uh, this is, you have two clocks, the same two, uh, well, not one in France, one in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And you have a, then you have a potential difference between both. Okay, you can calculate the potential difference with your model that comes from satellite techniques and gravimetry and ground. And these models come uh, with a lot of multiples. Right? It's a harmonic uh, com decomposition. And these are the degree of the spherical harmonic that you put in your model. And you can, you can go up to uh, 2,000 something. Um, yeah, 2,000 something. So, and here is the result of the clock. Uh, the, the, I mean, this is a real uh, comparison. And this, the two blue lines are, uh, is the uncertainty of the result of the clock, which, which has an error of around seven meters be because these are cesium clocks. So cesium clocks 10 to the minus 16 translated around 10 meters. Uh, okay, so you can see that at lowest order, of course, uh, the clocks are better, but if you go at higher order, then the models uh, the, the, geo, the geo potential models are good and fits uh, almost uh, in the middle in the error bar. Okay, so with seven meters, it's not enough, you see, to, to really uh, test these this geo potential models. But we can, in, in, the, in the future, when we have the mean to compare optical clocks on long distance with 10 to the minus 18, we will be able to. Here I just plotted an imaginary uh, comparison of, uh, two of these two same clocks if they would have an error bar of six centimeters. And you can see that you go really, you test really more the higher orders of the models. And there, it just fit there because I've put the bars here, but maybe it will be a bit there or there. I don't know. So this is within reach, let's say. Okay, now I, I will present very briefly three uh, big <coughs> projects we, 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 we work in. Uh, very briefly, the relativistic GNSS, because you are going to, to give a lot of details. But just, just uh, to continue a bit the introduction, this is how I see uh, the interest of this uh, relativistic uh, GNSS. 
these are the three pillars of uh, the global geodetic observing system with Earth rotation, gravity field, and geokinematics. And these three big fields, they intersect, and all, problem, all problems are linked to the, together. So this is basically a non-relativistic framework. So if you want to add relativity, you have, you have to add some correction somewhere with the problem that maybe it will not be coherent. Uh, there is a high intricacy of the problems, so you have uh, de degeneracy of parameters. Uh, there is a huge variety of observation in this system, like uh, VLBI, SLR, and uh, whatever. There are a lot, uh, lot of different techniques, and some it's really tough to, to check the coherency between all these different techniques. Uh, it's a heavy and dedicated uh, infrastructure on ground, of course, there's VLBI, tracking stations, satellites, gravimeter, etc. And uh, the Earth's gravity, anywhere, will limit the clocks on the ground to, 10 to, to around 10 to the minus 17. We begin to have some problem with the geopotential. Uh, so, question, how can we solve these problems? So, uh, maybe you will talk about ABC reference system. Of course, uh, then it's two, two simple ideas is, are to use inter-satellite links, for example, to, to, to be, uh, to <coughs> not, well, to, to go all in space and build a reference frame in space. And also use satellite orbits as clock because you can correct your atomic clock on the long term, thanks to the knowledge of the dynamics of your system. So here is the new uh, view, the relativistic view, where you have here the space-time metric, and you realize a spatiotemporal reference frame in space. So you go out of this problem of geokinematics and Earth rotation, uh, and you have less entanglement with Earth's internal dynamics. You, you don't need Earth station to maintain the space res reference frame, so you, you gain stability, well, we hope you gain stability and accuracy because it's based on well-known satellite dynamics and the orbits are very stable in time and can be very accurately described what you will show, what you will show after that. It's a positioning system intrinsically because the observation of four satellites will allow anyone to know its coordinates and it's a relativistic framework, so it gives m a deeper understanding of, of what positioning means and what are the sources of errors, etc. And there are several sci scientific applications, and I'm not going uh, to go too much into details. Uh, now, uh, we are involved in, um, in a space experiment, which is called ACES, uh, Atomic Clock Ensemble in Space. So we will be one of the data analysis center and we develop for now a simulation and uh, analysis software to simulation to prepare for the experiment. So this uh, experiment, what it is, is to send two clocks, FARO and SHM, in, uh, in the orbit in the ISS, International Space Station. And this will build a time in space of uh, high stability and accuracy, and it will allow to do this long distance comparison that I was talking about. Uh, maybe not yet at the, at the accuracy of the, of the optic optical clocks now, but if you're in common view, then you can get rid of, uh, in, some, in some extent, of the errors of the space clock and really compare the optical clocks on long distance. So the main scientific objectives of this uh, experiment are, uh, well, first to operate an atomic clock and a microwave link, which is very performing uh, in a space environment, to do di distant clock comparison, and you will be in common view uh, able to reach a stability of 0, 0,3 picoseconds only after 300 seconds of uh, comparison. Uh, and, well, 
we will be able to do equivalence principle tests, so test of the gravitational redshift, test of uh, Lorentz invariance, uh, and this I'm very involved in this test, uh, and the chronometric geodesy I was talking about, where we will be able to prove it at the level of 10 centimeters. So these are the different stations that will be uh, in <coughs> Australia, Japan, uh, Paris, Germany, England, UK, uh, two in uh, the States, and plus two uh, transportable stations, one that will go in different institutes and another one that will be used to calibrate the system. <coughs> And it's, uh, it will fly beginning of 2016, so for us it's like tomorrow. <laughs> we start to, to, to put the station in Paris, uh, we hope next month. And uh, there are a lot of preparation because it's a complicated uh, experiment because not only you have the space, space um, segment, but also the ground segment is very challenging and demanding and needs a lot of coordination because uh, what we want is to compare clocks in all these institutes so you have to put together a lot of people which are from different fields uh, and well, some organization <laughs> and the last uh, project uh, we are involved is uh, ITOC which is a GRP project uh, between five uh, different metrology lab in Europe and uh, what is the purpose of this is to do because you see that having a clock in your lab is good but if you cannot compare it then you cannot see if it's a good clock or not so this is uh, really a program where we plan to do as much comparisons as we can between optical clocks and this is in the view of redefining the second because the second unit is defined on the cesium clock, which is only only to 10 to the minus 16 accuracy. But with optical clocks, you could, can do much better. So the problem is if you want, you, you cannot really say, if you ask to a metrologist, they will say, you cannot say your optical clock is accurate because it's, it's more accurate than the definition of, of the, the accuracy is defined by, by the units, not by your clock. So you now we, we, we aim to, to, to find the best atom in the future or the best way to redefine the second with a better accuracy. So this is a coordinated program of clock and uh, there is a big uh, work package where you have to evaluate all the relativistic effects that influence uh, the comparison between clocks. Uh, and this, I'm, I'm responsible for this uh, package. So here are uh, well, different uh, comparison we plan to do. Uh, here are the different labs involved in Italy, Germany, Finland, uh, UK, and France. And all black points are different uh, clocks, uh, optical clocks based on different atoms. You see, you have iterbium, strontium, uh, strontium plus, so also there are two different techniques which are ion clocks and neutral clocks and uh, we don't know which is better, I mean they, they some are, have, have the advantages and pro and cons okay, so there will be also some satellite technique and a dedicated two-way experiment, experiment to compare these clocks uh, and for comparing all these clocks, you need also the gravitational redshift correction. And there is a program that aims to uh, ameliorate the knowledge of the gravitational field around this lab in Europe. So uh, we design setups to determine the static gravity potential at all clock locations. Uh, we develop a refined European geoid model uh, so this is done with uh, EFE in the University of Hanover, the team of Heinert Denker. And uh, they will also investigate the time variable components of the gravity potential. So here you can see the beginning of the refining of the geopotential at the, at the Paris Observatory. 
you can see here is uh, on the rooftop of the historical building. And here you can see the optical clock, which is uh, measured the height precisely uh, to be able to compute the relativistic uh, redshift corrections. And there will be also uh, a proof of principle of, of chronometric geodesy. Uh, the aim is uh, to demonstrate that the optical clocks can be used to measure the gravity potential differences. So this has already been done in the lab uh, with these 30 centimeters. But here we plan to do it uh, on a long distance. Uh, so there will be a 90 kilometers optical fiber link between LSM, Laboratoire Souterrain de Modane, and uh, INRIM in Torino. Uh, and there will be a one kilometer difference height between both clocks. So this will lead to a, a big redshift correction. And we hope <laughs> we can see some geophysical effects or we, we don't know yet what we, we will be able to see, but we hope to attain at least 10 to the minus 17 uh, accuracy with high temporal resolution. So to finish, I will, get, I will uh, talk about some ideas for the future. So this, this first sketch is, uh, you have to remember that we will be limited on ground for the clocks. So the idea is to put in geostationary a constellation with high accuracy clocks that are not um, perturbed by the Earth's gravitational field and that would disseminate a very stable time to GNSS constellation that doesn't have also this very high accurate clock and the Earth. And also, you can think the other way around and think about a LEO constellation, so low Earth orbit constellation, that will be much more sensitive to the geopotential to be able, which is linked with GNSS and with the geostationary constellation, that will be able to measure really the gravitational field. Plus, clocks on the ground. So here I have put clocks on the ground, which would not be used to uh, build a time as it is done now. Uh, now we build the time on the Earth, this atomic time, and we synchronize the GNSS constellation to this ground time. But if you want to have a very accurate time, then you build the time in the space and you say, okay, not, uh, not that I have this very accurate time, I will use my clocks on the ground as instrument to probe the gravitational field. And this would be uh, a set of ground clocks linked together with the constellations of satellites. And with this, you would be able to realize the geoid, uh, well, the isochronometric surface of reference. Uh, you would be able to measure static and time-varying gravitational field, but in high, uh, with a high uh, spatial resolution not like with the space experiment, with at the, which is a less, uh, spe less high spatial resolution. Uh, okay. And now this is a bit in a different, uh, let's say, uh, view. But you can imagine a transportable optical clock, which is compared to a reference clock, to do long distance leveling. So what's leveling? It's uh, measure, measuring height. And this is uh, well, a, big, uh, a big thing in, uh, in uh, all countries to, to measure the height. And this is very operational. And you have different techniques. I will not go into the details with GPS, with uh, lasers, blah, blah, blah. And you could use the clock to measure the height on long distances without biases, which is the big thing today is we have the, 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 the more you go, the, f the further away you go, the, the more biases you, you get. Okay. So here is the conclusion. I'm not going to go again into each of uh, these points. Just, uh, I want just to, 
to, to talk about a new project that we start uh, now, that uh, we have uh, we hired a postdoc for two years to, uh, to, to see all the application you can get from the clubs to geophysics. So in geophysics, we will study what you can get more with the clocks for the temporal variation of the potential, for example, linked to, se se to, to seismic waves or, or things like this, or, uh, or for the static gravity potential in uh, mountains or hilly, hilly lands, where uh, having the potential directly uh, and not only uh, the derivative of the potential, because today you can access only the derivatives of the potential with gravi gravimeters or gradiometers. Okay, but the, the clocks they give a really really new observable, which is the potential directly, and and this is good when you have high um, uh, w when you need high spatial resolution, like in uh, mountains or, 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 or along the coast. So we begin uh, a project to, to check how, how the high special resolution models of the gravity field will uh, be improved by this uh, optical cross. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>